Okay, and welcome to the review of this game. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire is a shit show. <laughs> Just straight up, it's a shit show. Oh my god. That... That ending encounter with Voldemort just sums up everything that's terrible about this game so succinctly. It's so sad. It's it's so sad. What makes it even worse is the fact that I can see the potential that was put into this game and how much work and effort was put into redesigning pretty much everything from the bottom up. Um... Yeah, so let's just get into it. Um, starting off with the good points, most of which is conceptual and not necessarily what came out in the final product. Conceptually, this game has a lot going for it. The mechanics have been just completely changed since the first three games. I mean, it has a completely different setup with the spells. It changes how the party system works from the third game to a much better degree, I would have to say. Um, companion AI is way better than in the in the last game um, and they've they've really just completely changed the level design um, and not necessarily for the worse I actually feel like the level design in this game overall was pretty good on its own now I'm talking about level layout, I'm not talking about enemy placements yet. So bear with me. Um the visuals this was upgraded for this was a this game was redesigned for new platforms, so this came out on the Xbox, the PlayStation 2, I believe, and of course for PC. And there may have been some other consoles that it was released on, I'm not sure. But the visuals were very much upgraded for those platforms. Um, and it looks way better. The animations are far more fluid. Just overall, visually, it looks, it looks great. Compared to the first few games. Um, Polygon-wise and all that stuff. I still feel like it's lacking in the color contrast department though I, f I really feel like the second game nailed that and the first game was way up there as far as color contrast is concerned because the first and second games looked beautiful despite their age they really have their own character because of the coloring and starting with the third game it seems that this series kind of lost that unfortunately which is a shame, but it is what it is. And as per usual, the music in this game was awesome. It's kind of a given with anything Harry Potter related, though it seems. But that's alright. I kind of feel like that's the, the end of the good stuff, unfortunately. And here's where I'm going to start comparing it to other games as well as on its own merit. Because there's a lot of points to make here. Most of my comparisons are going to be with the third game because that is the game where I felt like the series started to go downhill for me personally. I haven't played 5 and beyond, so I don't know what those games are like yet. I've heard good things, but we're not talking about them in this review. Um. The third game changed a few things, but it still worked on the old formula of the first two Harry Potter games. There were a lot of things I didn't like about that game, um, and some of them for very good reason, but I've actually grown to 
hate the game less than I than I used to when I first played through it. Um, because it was different. You know, they they changed some what I saw as essential pieces to the Harry Potter to the Harry Potter formula that they didn't necessarily need to, but the game didn't get worse because of that. Um, there are definitely still some pieces in that game that are terrible. Um, but that game was okay. This game was terrible. There was, there was so much potential that I saw from what they had done with the revamp of all the mechanics and made it its own game, essentially. You know, this, this game is not... I have to say it's almost not comparable to the first three games because it's based on an entirely different setup. Um, it works within the Harry Potter universe and you're playing as Harry Potter, but that's it. There's an entirely different design mentality behind it. The party system that was introduced in the third game was worked on a lot in this game. The companion AI is much more um, motivated, I guess would be the word. It's much more willing to help you with tasks and do things on their own, such as uh, taking care of enemies that show up on the levels. That was one of the things that I actually really liked about this game, was the fact that they worked so much on the companion AI. Since you're having to play as a party now, whether you're playing as Harry, Hermione, or Ron, the other two will help out with things. They won't just stand idly by and talk at you. Thank God for that, because that was one of my big pet peeves about the third game, was the fact that they would tell you to explore and then remind you constantly that there was a class to attend. There's something that we need to do while you're exploring. With this game, they didn't do that. Instead, it was almost forced... I wouldn't say forced exploration, but the level design and the game design in general promoted... How do I put this? It almost required level it almost required level exploration because of how it was set up. Which I actually appreciate. Um, because it did not require a hundred percenting anything, but it did require going back through certain areas and taking a second look. Um, which is where the shields came into play. Because in order to unlock new stages, you had to collect shields from levels that you'd played through. And I actually really liked this mechanic because, again, it required you to explore a little bit. Um, but the, there were a lot of issues with the shield system. I mean, first off, you had to find the damn things. <laughs> Which in of itself actually wasn't too difficult, all things considered, but... Um, once you got to the shields, some of them were really easy to collect. Others were hidden or were inaccessible because of one thing or another. And regardless of how difficult it was to get a shield, it forced... A level end. It required you to go back to the main screen after you had collected the shield. Which was eternally frustrating for me for a probably about three fourths, of, three fourths of the game. And the reason for that is because it oftentimes you'd be nearby a shield and You'd collect it, and there would be another shield not too far away from you. You could see it on screen sometimes. 
but because of the fact that the collecting the shield forced you to end the level, you had to backtrack all the way through that level to get back to where the other shield was. And once you completed a level the first time around, you know, the first time you've seen that level, you always spawned at a central point in the level. There was a spawn point that was always there. Regardless of where the last shield was that you wanted to collect, there was only one spawn point. And very rarely were any of the shields near that spawn point. So anytime you collected one, even if there was a shield nearby it, nearby that shield that you just collected, you had to go back to that spawn point and go through the entire level again to get to that shield that you'd seen. Which meant resetting a whole bunch of platforming puzzles, which meant a bunch of, a, of the an enemies respawning, which meant a whole myriad of issues that showed up in the level design, which ended up being flaws rather than really cool features. Um, with the enemies, that was probably one of the biggest issues with the with the level design. Um, the very first level that we played through, uh, the not the introduction level, the Hogwarts exterior. That one I probably enjoyed the most because of the fact that it was. 80% exploring and then 20% combat. There wasn't a whole lot to fight, and when you did fight, it was brief, and there was a reward on the end of it. The second level was a little different to the Forbidden Forest. That was more kind of... There was a... I felt like there was a really nice balance between going through the level and actually fighting the dug bogs that you encountered. Some of the issues with the level design on that level were not related to combat so much as to the uh, boobo tubers, which I'll get into later. But as the levels progressed, the enemies in the levels got more plentiful, and they also got more annoying and frustrating to deal with. That probably peaked... Prefect's bathroom was pretty bad. The swarms of... What were those guys called? The little imp things. Were frustrating to deal with because there were so many of them, and they were ranged. But they didn't pose that much of a threat on their own. The Herbology level, on the other hand, introduced... Mosps. And Mosps are perhaps the one enemy in this game that are the biggest piece of shit on the planet. They are so annoying to deal with, I don't know why they thought it was a good idea to have an enemy that could hit stun you and then attack you again before you even got up. Those... That was on... That was one at a time. A lot of times, those guys would come in swarms, and it made the Herbology level, which was otherwise a beautiful, engaging level, incredibly frustrating to deal with. I couldn't take the time to just enjoy the level for what it was, because I was constantly being assaulted by these giant bags of putricity. It was so bad. And that's one of the big issues with this game, is the fact that the animal... The animals? The enemies... <laughs> the enemies are, for the most part, often plentiful enough at certain points in the game to completely detract from the rest of the game's experience. That includes the very first challenge, which was the Dugbog Abifors. Because those guys came in swarms. 
and as improved as the companion AI is, it is still not competent enough to deal with the new influx of enemies that they introduced in this game. It is not competent enough to deal with the influx of new puzzles that they introduced in this game. It is incredibly frustrating when you are holding an enemy up in the air with a Wingardium Leviosa charm and you have 12 other enemies that are surrounding you and are constantly attacking you. And your companion AIs are fighting off the other creatures instead of attacking the one that you have held up in the air and are constantly dropping because you're getting attacked and stunned out of casting that spell. Very frustrating mechanics. Um, and because of that, this game really... probably unintentionally, but it really encouraged spell spamming. It encouraged a lot of that mashing the attack button, or mashing in this particular case the jinx button, to just get rid of the enemies. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of thought that went into, at least in my case, there wasn't a whole lot of thought that went into fighting the enemies with spells. And that's another point that I want to talk about, is the spellcasting system. Which, in of itself, I feel like they really improved from the previous games. Um, there was more of a mix of spells that you could cast on enemies. It wasn't just... I think it was Rick to Sempra for the second and third games, and then and then a Flipendo to do whatever to them. Um, I think it was just Flipendo, Flipendo in the first game. I can't remember for sure though. Um, but what was really cool about it was that you could combo spells. You could actually combo your Jinx and your Charm spells and get different effects out of them. I don't feel like any of them really did any more damage, but it was kind of cool to see the characters casting different spells. In the gameplay itself, however, you didn't really... It didn't really add a whole lot, I don't feel. Because a lot of times these spell combos would require you to do different combinations of jinxes and charms. Um, in both cases, the jinxes and the charms were just... Um, were automatically selected. So, a ground enemy, if you stunned it, well, even if you didn't stun it, Wingardium Leviosa would be the spell of choice to pick it up. Um, except for the Salamanders, which would be the Aqua Eructus to put out their fire. So, as far as choosing what spells you wanted to use, you couldn't really do that. But, I mean, whatever wasn't a huge deal um, the different card effects from the folio universitas that you could get were kind of cool as well because it changed how your jinx played out and how powerful your jinxes were which I thought was pretty darn cool personally the fact that you could cast a jinx and have it turn to three jinxes or the fact that you could cast a Jinx and it would ricochet off of enemies. That was pretty darn cool. Um, and speaking of which, the Folio Universitas was... I feel like it was a... pretty radical change over the first three games. Um, in the first three games, you had to find and collect the cards. Um, and in the third game, you could purchase... You could do that in the second game as well, where you could purchase certain cards through vendors by using um, Birdie Bot's beans that you had collected. It was your currency, basically. Uh, the, the beans were, not the, not the cards. Um, and the beans stayed your currency in this game as well. But... There wasn't any collecting of the Folio Universitas cards. It was simply unlocking sets by completing certain quests 
that you could do throughout the games, whether it was finding dragon statues or shovels or whatever and casting a, casting a jinx on them. Or if it was casting a certain number of this type of spell on an enemy of this type. Or if it was simply getting to a spell level high enough that you could unlock a set of cards and just having enough beans to purchase those cards. The issue that I had with those cards, though, was the fact that it was one of the really charming things that I found about the Folio, Ma Folio Magi. Folio Magi? Folio Magi? I still don't know how to pronounce it. That's really sad. Okay, so Magi works. Um... One of the things that I found really charming about the Folio Magi in the previous games was the fact that it told you about different characters in the Harry Potter universe. Wizards and witches and whatever else that sometimes were just in the Harry Potter universe and other times they were um, actual characters or people that you'd find in history. And sometimes it would be... Um, somebody from mythology, somebody, sometimes it would be somebody that was a real person, somebody that actually existed. Which I thought was pretty cool. And added a bit onto the history of Harry Potter because it would add its own little twist on the person or the character. And just have a little bit of influence in how expansive the world seemed in comparison to what you were playing as in Harry Potter's life you know, through that one grade year. They didn't have any of that in this game. It was just simply... Um, each of the cards was simply a photograph of a scene from the movie. Which, I haven't seen the movie. For some people, I'm sure that was a great piece of, oh my gosh, this is based on the movie, they got scenes from it, it's so cool. Personally, I couldn't have cared less. <laughs> um, I suffered from, I read the books first, so the movies automatically suck, so I didn't get past the second movie. But, oh well. But I feel like the cards lost a lot of their charm, despite how much utility they got. From becoming buffs to the characters rather than just a collectible. So that might be part of why I didn't like this game as much, was because they had lost their charm that they had in the prior games, and just became a movie pop culture reference, more than anything. But the fact that they had an applicable use in the game was pretty cool. I really enjoyed that aspect. Um, and the cards could provide buffs to a lot of things, whether it was your Axio collection spell, whether it was to your Jinxes, your Jinx styles, whether it was to your character directly in some form or other, whether it was to your stamina, which is the health in this game, um, whether it was a companion buff, or whatever. They got really creative with the mechanics. Well, they didn't get terribly creative, but they did have some interesting um, applications for the for the cards in this game. This is going to be a long review. <laughs> now, the... One of the things that they provided a buff to was also the um... Magicus Extremos, which was a buff in the game that you could apply to your characters for a limited amount of time, which would increase spellcasting power. I never used it, um, partially because I honestly couldn't tell you why I used it. I think it was more of the fact that for the keyboard, at least, Z was the Axio spell, X was the Jinx casting, and C was the Charms. Then there's this inconvenient little key set up above the X, the S button, 
which is the Magicus Extremos. And for myself, I was getting a little bit too lazy and just not reaching up and hitting that button. Despite the fact that I knew that the, that the Magicus Extremos was there, and the fact that it's really not that far away from the X, you know? <laughs> I moved my finger up a quarter inch and I hit the button. Big deal. But I also came from the first three games where there wasn't any sort of spell casting buff that you could get from pressing a button. So it wasn't a... It wasn't really something that I wanted to do because I felt like I shouldn't need that kind of a buff to help myself in fights. Which makes, which made a lot of the game much more difficult, especially in the herbology level with the mosps. Um, so that's kind of on me. But the fact that they had to, that they had to introduce a mechanic, so that some parts of the game would be easier, kind of makes me question what they were going for design-wise because in the final encounter with Voldemort, which I'll get into more later, you didn't... I didn't really need... I didn't even have a Magicus Extremos bar. I didn't have any of that. And I had no place to use it. There was... Uh, I, I have a lot of resistance to the Magicus Extremos. For the reasons that I've mentioned. I feel like it's a gimmicky mechanic that if they had put more thought into the level design and the enemy design would not be necessary at all. But, yeah, it is what it is and some people really like it, so whatever, I guess. Um, I personally don't like it. Now, one of the things that came into conflict with um, combat casting was the fact that the camera angles in this game have been completely revamped. In the first three games, it was a third-person view where you'd be behind Harry Potter looking over his head, pretty much. In this game, it's changed to more of a... I kind of want to say like a a DMC Devil May Cry kind of kind of camera angles because it's no longer over the person sh it's no longer over Harry's shoulder it's this arbitrary location that's following the characters and changes based on where in the level you are the problem with that is with the multitude of enemies a lot of them would end up off screen simply because of how the camera angle decided to be depending where you were standing. And that made the combat so frustrating. I mean, I've talked about this enough in the actual playthrough itself, but the camera angles in this game were fucking terrible. And what made it worse was the fact that one of the things that happens in a lot of character action games, like Devil May Cry, is that the enemies become less aggressive when they're off camera. That was not the case in this game. And the other thing is, a lot of times you can target enemies that are off camera in character action games. At least I think I think that's the case. In this game, you could sometimes, but more than often, more often than not, you couldn't. Which meant that if you had an enemy that was ranged or really fast, like a Mosp or one of those little imp guys, they could continually they could hit you from off screen and you would have no way to deal with them until they had gotten into the camera view which oftentimes meant that you'd have to walk straight up to them and risk taking some damage and the same applied to casting spells different charms on objects that were off screen it didn't work and that was a major source of frustration in this game. I think that was actually probably one of the biggest disappointments, or one of the biggest frustrations with this game, was the camera angles. 
because all of the other issues that I have with this game, um, with how the gameplay works out, are actually relatively minor, all things considered. You bundle those together and it becomes a bit of an annoyance, but it's not terrible. But with the camera, okay, aside from the ridiculous number of mosps in the herbology level. But with the camera angles, all of those issues are exacerbated tenfold. Now, granted, with a third-person perspective like in the first three games, I don't know that it would have been any better. Because of the fact that you'd be looking around and you wouldn't have any way to see what's behind you. But you could move the camera around if you had that kind of a viewpoint. There is zero way to change the camera angle in this game. Which means that it's you're stuck with what you got and you have to move your character in order to change what you see. Which can also mean death in a lot of cases. Which is frustrating. And incredibly annoying when you have to deal with what the game throws at you with its other issues. So, camera angle is probably my biggest complaint, and is probably my biggest reason for this game being rated a piece of shit, <laughs> and not being recommended to anybody, um, especially if you enjoyed the first three games. Especially if you enjoyed the first three games. Now, also keep in mind that I was playing on my lonesome. I did not have anybody that was playing this game with me, I had two companion AIs. I feel like this game, um, one of the things that this game offers is the fact that you can actually play more than one character. You can choose to play between Harry, Hermione, or Ron, and you can have at least one player play. You can have up to three players play the entire game in co-op, with the exception of the final level. That means that you wouldn't have to deal with the companion AI if you had two friends over. And this game would be that much smoother because of it. You'd be able to coordinate your spells way better. You'd be able to focus um, on tasks all at once and get things done instead of your AIs wandering around casting spells at random to hit enemies or for some reason decide that a Bubo tuber needed to be flung in some random direction. Um, and navigate around Bubo tubers instead of getting stuck on them and going ah ah every two seconds because they couldn't navigate their way around this damn plant that's staying in one place. <laughs> Ugh. So with if you are going to play this game, I actually would recommend it if you have a friend or two that would be willing to play it with you. Uh, I would imagine that's what, that this would actually be a lot of fun. And the challenges would also probably be a lot easier too, since you'd have it more than one person helping out with doing the challenges. Um, and on a slightly unrelated note, with the combined castings, that would also probably be much easier. But why the hell did they have the characters move around? when they aren't actually moving the block. It makes it so frustrating when the char when you're casting a Wingardium Leviosa spell or whatever spell Wingardium Leviosa, let's go with the big blocks first. You cast your Wingardium Leviosa on this gigantic block that needs to be moved. You can't lift it without your companions helping, right? So while they're trying to get into position, your character's doing all sorts of weird little dances back and forth, sometimes going right up to the block, other times going as far back as she can go, as he can go, until the spell has to break because he's out of range. What the fuck? Seriously? And the same thing happened with the Bubo tubers, where it had this arbitrary movement that would go on, so trying to aim those things, which should have been a very easy issue, became a chore. The fact that I had to fight the game to do what I wanted the game to do in the first place 
was incredibly frustrating. I should not have to fight against the controls just so I can remain in place. Anybody who has played this game, at least on the keyboard, understands what I'm talking about. That was so stupid. And it's gotten to the point in the review where I started to get into so much of the bad stuff where it's getting frustrating just thinking about it. And so this game is going to go downhill in my review because of that fact. With the exploring, some of which required some arbitrary whatever of that fact. A huge caveat is the fact that you're not really interacting with any of the professors aside from Moody. Who... I don't think they actually ever covered his story, considering that he's such a major point in the character in the game plot. Or in the story plot, rather. This game was all about the gameplay, and very little of it was based on the book. Or the movie for that matter. I feel like hardly any of it was based on the movie, which I didn't even see. <laughs> they had they took such liberties with the game story that I feel like actually would have contributed to the gameplay if they had decided to follow the story closer than what they ended up doing for this game. Which... I don't know. I, f I feel like this game could have had an entirely different outcome if they had followed the story more closely, like the first couple games did, and decided to go for gameplay based off the story rather than the opposite which was, let's just make a game that plays well, which they failed at, by the way, and ignore the story almost completely. We'll just loosely base the game on the Harry Potter story of the, of the fourth book. Just... The, the final fight. What was that? That whole encounter with Voldemort was just absolutely terrible. I'll even stop here for a moment and just... To anybody else that read the book before playing this game or watching my playthrough of it, I am so sorry. But what was that encounter with Voldemort at the end of this game? Seriously. There wasn't any substance to it. It was entirely a gimmick fight. There wasn't any actual fighting Voldemort, which I suppose makes sense considering story-wise he's this all-powerful wizard that's feared by everybody, and Harry Potter's what, in his fourth year in this game? So he's not going to be able to do jack against this guy. But there were no skeletons in that encounter. There was no dodging giant statues being thrown at your face kind of deal and trying to destroy the block rather than just, oh my god, that whole thing with the, with the conflicting spells. They didn't even explain. This, uh... It, it, they're, they're relying on people to understand the plot from the book or the movie, but they don't follow the story or of the, either one in this game. Ah! Okay, so now that I've recovered from my aneurysm... <laughs> Seriously, that whole... That whole encounter with Voldemort was just a shit show and showed all of the flaws that this game had. With the camera angles, with the spell casting, with the lack of regard to the original plots of the book, and the slightly revised but very similar plot of the movie, um, the... 
issues the the final fight showed what this game was at its core without the added on um magicos extremos without the extra cards that you get in the folio universitas without the party system this game is terrible <laughs> the physics that are involved in a lot of the situations with controlling certain things are utterly ridiculous and by physics I mean what your character does when you're trying to control something I don't know why they had this whole encounter with trying to move the conflicting spell energies between the two wands around to destroy various objects it's not how it was presented in the book at all and I highly doubt it's how it was presented in the movie either because I remember very clearly in the book, there was a, it was pretty much the characters had to stand still. And there was a visual um, design that happened between the two characters, Harry Potter and Voldemort, that was, de that was described in the book. Where it basically became this field that both of them had to um, fight in, not necessarily cast spells at each other, but because the spells, because their wands were linked, the spells locked, and one of them had to remain more steady than the other to keep the spell energy from getting to them. And whoever was more unstable ended up with the energy of the spells being sent back to them and being released from their wands into their hands, into their face, basically. And they would lose that. Um, the spells themselves would be would be rendered moot, but the spell energy behind it would not. And that is the reason that Harry Potter escaped, was the fact that he managed to hold the spell energy back better than Voldemort did. And that gave him enough time to get the hell out of there with Cedric's body and grab the port key. Um... So, yeah, I... Uh, that whole encounter with Voldemort just left a sour taste in my mouth. It was... it was really bad. And I wish I could have shown off the first time I experienced the fight, but unfortunately, my footage got corrupted. And... So... You know, I ended up having to show you the compressed version where I knew what I was doing. And then, of course, um... Well, <laughs> the couple of the two attempts before that where I tried playing on my desktop rather than on my laptop. And for whatever reason, the game really doesn't like me playing it on my desktop. And I'll show you why right here. Expected. Come on, Harry! Let's see what... Schoolboy spells you have up your sleeve. Uh. It'll be quick. It might even be painless. Okay, camera, you are not helping at all. So, what exactly are we doing here? Well, this is definitely just for the gameplay. Um, there was no skeleton summoning when Voldemort was actually interacting with Harry. Oop, that's a skeleton in my face. I'm just gonna run this way real quick. Not playing hide and seek. Yeah, I get that. Would you like a skeleton? No? Alright. I'm gonna wait on that. Oh, well done, Harry. Don't need double talk. I'll see you now. <laughs> what a mocker. Making a mockery of Dumbledore's teachings. Okay, apparently they heard if I just walk into what the heck. Oh my goodness. You have to do better than that, Harry. Okay but then. Break. That hurts, didn't it, Harry? What? <laughs> I thought you'd been told how to duel, Harry. This is very bizarre. Um. Does this mean you're tired of dueling, Harry? I'll be right back in just a minute after this issue's. What the fuck? Okay, this is all sorts of weird. So that was that for weird. 
<laughs> uh. So yeah, that's this game. Um, there were a lot of good points about it, but there were a lot of things that were really, really bad. To the point where I would say this game is actually worse than the third game. Which is kind of weird, though, considering that I actually enjoy this game more than I enjoyed the third one. Probably because I lowered my expectations a lot for this game coming in, because I heard how bad it was. So, but yeah. Um, a couple things I actually haven't talked about. I didn't talk about the Triwizard tasks themselves. Um, the Triwizard tasks themselves, I felt like were kind of... meh. Once again, it was set up to have its own gameplay thematics without really caring about what the story itself had. Um, the first one was actually pretty good. I didn't mind that it deviated a bit from the, from the story version because basically what did happen was the fact that Harry Potter... Axio firebolted, he got on his firebolt and evaded the dragon as best he could. He evaded the horntail by flying around on his broomstick. And in the book, and I imagine in the movie as well, that was just over the arena where the dragon had its nest, or her nest I imagine. Um, in the game it was more flying around the entirety of Hogwarts. But he's still, it's the basic premise of him flying around avoiding the horn tail. And I really liked how they set that system up with the speeding and everything. It, that was an adrenaline rush. I loved it. Um, and the fact that it was timed, not that there was a timer on it, and the less time that it took you to get through the level, or through the task, rather, you'd get a reward based on that. And in the Triwizard tasks... In the Triwizard Tasks, those were in the forms of shields. Um, in the first two, anyway. You didn't get any shields out of the third one. I don't think. The second Triwizard Task was easily the low point of the Triwizard Tasks. Because it was underwater, it was this... It was this linear path of what in the book was a desperate timed search for your compatriots. And there were a lot of details that I complained about in the playthrough when I actually went through that area. But the fact that it's a linear path and it's more of a rail, an on-rail shooter sequence than what could have been a really cool exploration sequence. Once again, my expectations were not met, and I was severely disappointed. Um, and I also found that level really boring in comparison to the rest of the game. Um, it wasn't there wasn't any like major maneuvering around that I did or uh, fast enemies that I had to deal with. It wasn't frustrating so much as it was just dull for me. Because nothing exciting really happened. It's, it's oh, I have to break this wall and I have to swim some more. You know, big frickin' deal. Um, that was slightly less the case in the third one in the third Triwizard task. That was actually somewhat enjoyable. Um, it was more of a maze than anything, which was true of what happened in the story as well, and in the movie, I would imagine. Um, but there were different enemies to fight and various obstacles that you had to deal with. And as much as I don't necessarily appreciate what they did with the different encounters that you had in the game, or yeah, how they handle the encounters that originally occurred in the book in the maze. It's also kind of nice that they threw those um, incidents of the attacks on Harry Potter being thrown into cutscenes. 
because it felt like a cop out, but it was quick and it was quickly dealt with. And it was still in a fashion that went along with the story. The whole fighting the, um, uh, whatever those big turtle things were at the end to help Cedric escape from the vines was kind of meh, but the encounter itself was enjoyable. Um, the maze itself was was decent. I don't I didn't really care for it, but um, I don't mind it being in the game. The second try was our task. I feel like they should have just dumped entirely because it was terrible. But the third one, I don't mind being in there. Um, yeah, that's kind of about it. Now, on the once again on the exploration front, there weren't any real secrets in this game. Um, as far as exploring was concerned. And one of the biggest points was that you never actually got to go inside Hogwarts to explore the school. You got to explore outside a lot, but you didn't get to explore anything inside. And... That's not really a, a point to take away from the, from the game itself, but that is a really big bummer, because both... Well, the first three games, most of it took place inside the school. It took place inside Hogwarts. And a lot of what happens in the fourth book and in the fourth game, or fourth movie, sorry, happen inside the school. So, not a huge fan of the fact that you never got to explore Hogwarts, but for me personally, it's a, it's a small detail that isn't that big compared to the rest of the issues that this game has. So, yeah, I don't know. I would not recommend this game at all, especially if you're playing by yourself. If you're playing with friends, then maybe, but if you're playing by yourself, don't get this game. It's terrible. Uh, if you have any other viewpoints on this game, whether it's specific details, or if you did like the game, or if you didn't like the game, you got a comment section. You know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. This was less of a rage-filled rant than it was about the third game, but um, I did get overheated on a few points nonetheless, because this game is a shit show in comparison with the first three, which is saying a lot considering how much I dislike the third game. But that is the end of this review. I hope you all enjoyed this video and the and this let's play of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And I will see you in the next video and in the next Harry Potter series. Until then, have a wonderful day everybody and take care. Bye for now.